Hello, my name is Don Fleming. I'm the Senior Education Coordinator at CASM, and I'm happy to welcome you to this Lunch and Learn presented by CASM's Research and Scholarship Committee. The, this presentation is a, in, in, this, in this series of our Lunch and Learns focus on use of machine learning, artificial intelligences, and big data implications for nursing research and education. I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. Kazan's off national office is located on the traditional territory of the Algonquin people. And we would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region and in all regions across Canada. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders past, present, and future. Lunch and Learns are a popular tool in academia to encourage scholarship. Faculty members come together to, during their lunch hour to share their work and to network. CASM's webinar series presented by the Research and Scholarship Committee aims to recreate the collegial feel of the Lunch and Learn and is intended to serve as an inspiration and a networking opportunity. Nursing faculty from across the country present on a scholarship project and discuss methodologies, successes or challenge that they've encountered in their work. We'll be recording most of today's session and, and begin with a presentation from, from Charlene and we'll conclude with 50 to 20 minutes of question and answer after the presentation. Please note that CASM does not distribute the PowerPoint presentations and just a reminder to keep your microphones turned off. So in this session, We'll hear from Dr. Charlene Ronquillo, who will present Nurses' Roles and Data Foundations for Equitable Artificial Intelligence. Charlene, thank you for presenting today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Dawn, and thank you everyone for joining. I'm seeing the numbers trickle in, and it's very exciting to see this much engagement um, and interest in AI and big data analytics and nursing. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Um, to start, I will share my screen here. There we go. Um, can folks please give me a thumbs up in the chat yep. if you can we see can, that? Yep. Yes, we can see Perfect. it. Perfect. Perfect. Um, yes, so uh, thank you uh, for having me um, join you here today. My name is Charlene Ronquillo. I'm an assistant professor at the School of Nursing at UBC Okanagan, um, where I lead the Health Informatics Equity Lab, where a lot of our work these days um, are working on things related to artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, as they relate to nursing and nursing work. Uh, today, I'll be talking to you about nurses' roles and data foundations for equitable artificial intelligence and hopefully catalyze some interesting conversation. I'm really curious to hear from folks about kind of your thinking around this topic area, you know, where, where have there been conversations Sorry, let me move that. Um, where you've heard conversations, had conversations about this topic area, and just kind of get a get, get a general sense of where people's thinking are at. Hmm. In terms of um, logistics, uh, feel free to drop questions into the chat, and I will try to get with. Um, I'll glance at that every now and then um, to see if um, you know I can answer that right away, or if it'd be better to leave it off till the end. So um, I'll move on from here. Um, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge my privilege um, in being the position that I'm in to speak with you all today and join you from the traditional territories of the Silks Okanagan. Um, I, I think it's important for us to pause and acknowledge the privilege that we have gained as settlers, the benefits that we've gained from the histories and structures of colonization on this land and the institutions that we have built upon them. And so um, in hopes to kind of moving beyond the land acknowledgement today, um, I hope to contribute to democratizing knowledge, sharing knowledge, building our collective wisdom, working in solidarity towards truth and reconciliation. And I do think that this um, talk in particular speaks to nursing's role towards that as we move into AI, machine learning enabled futures and, and you know, hopefully talk a little bit with you about what that means on a practical level. 
And so um, my hope today um, in this Lunch and Learn is that we can have some conversations about how nurses shape data content and quality of these data in health systems. Um, and then what does that mean for downstream implications for AI development and performance? And so why are we talking about AI and nursing? I'm sure a lot of you here are here because of a lot of the hype and the drama that's been unfolding over the last uh, year or so with the kind of launch of ChatGPT onto the world. Everybody's kind of flipped out. Um, and I think we're calming down again a little bit, hopefully. I don't know. There's something new every day. Um, but this conversation around AI and nursing, you know, Prior to using AI broadly, we were using big data, big data analytics, um, kind of uh, looking at the use of aggregated huge amounts of data to, to build tools and predictions and things like that. So in relation to nursing, why are we talking about this? Well, this is gonna be obvious to everybody here. Nurses complete the most clinical documentation in healthcare systems. Um, okay. In the world of AI, um, you know, data is, what makes AI even possible. If we don't have the data, we can't really do anything with that. And so thinking about, you know, the amount of documentation that we have to complete, the question that we raise then is, how much of that is used for AI? How much of that is usable for AI? Should we or shouldn't we use it? What does it need to look like to move into futures where this technology is actually serving the nursing profession? Um, we know that not all nursing documentation is used well, um, particularly when we're talking about secondary uses, like crunching, you know, numbers for um, predictions of risk, for um, trending and things like that, um, because of, you know, kind of what nursing data looks like and the nature of it. And also as the largest healthcare professional group, um, we um, as a profession are end user targets for AI down the line, um, clinical decision support tools. If you think about um, the flags that pop up as you're documenting in electronic health records, um, you know, recommendations, um, conflicts that arise, um, those are kind of a uh, nice way to think about it is those are kind of simplified um, clinical decision supports, whereas AI is generally just going to kind of power those up for us and kind of put more information in when they're making those recommendations. And so what does that mean then when we have kind of more powerful engines driving the recommendations that we're getting from these um, systems and electronic health records? So one of our um, initial attempts to have the conversation was pulling together um, this think tank um, a few years back now um, of the Nursing and Artificial Intelligence Leadership Collaborative or the NAIL Collaborative. Um, we brought together a group um, across all yeah. disciplines, clinical, um, uh, clinical, ethical, social, legal, and tried to get at the various angles and thinking about what does AI look like for nursing? What are the conversations that we need to be having? What are the questions that we need to be asking um, as we move into this world? Of kind of more digitalization. And a result of that, I won't go, um, I won't talk too much in depth about the result in paper, but just flagging it here for you in case you would like to read further was um, this summary paper about priorities and opportunities that were identified in that think tank um, around kind of what needs to happen um, in the profession um, in order to move this work forward to ensure that AI that are developed are going to be serving our needs rather than nursing serving the needs of AI, because we know that that is something that all, often happens with technology development. Um, so trying to summarize the key points in that paper, um, we tried to distill it into these um, kind of three things that need to we need to deal with as a profession to move AI and nursing forward. So one is, um, you know, all nurses, uh, whether students in practice, in leadership roles, all research, all, education, all levels, um, have to have some basic understanding of the relationship between data collection and the AI technology that they use. Nurses have to be meaningfully involved in all stages um, of AI from development to implementation. And then third is kind of visioning forward for a positive future is the use for, of AI for good nursing. So today's talk is really trying to address this first bit around you know, spreading uh, the word or having these conversations around the relationship between data collection and AI technology. 
Um, I'll come back to this slide later on, but generally kind of this, uh, or I'll, I can talk about it now, actually, uh, the summary of that paper is that the bottom line, you know, these technologies are going to change the profession of nursing to what extent um, and in what ways I think some of that, you know, we, we, we still do have control over um, depending on how in, engaged we choose to be or we are able to be in this kind of early process. Um, AI can enhance and extend nursing capabilities um, with nursing as leaders for AI and health. And I think this is something that I think really has great potential. Um, AI has a lot to learn from nursing. Um, and I think if we are ahead of it, um, we can certainly be leaders in this field. Um, and thank you. Uh, yes, I will post the DOI of that paper um, uh, later on after the talk, if that's okay. So then you can uh, refer to that. And so um, just clarifying language, um, some of you may have attended the session, the last Lunch and Learn session where Dr. Riesling um, very nicely um, made a distinction between definitions and things um, around, you know, what is AI, machine learning, deep learning, natural language processing. So when I talk about AI today, it's really kind of this broad idea. So I'm not talking about actually intelligent um you know, agents and machines, because we, we're not there yet. Uh, but I'm just talk. Uh, I'm using it as a catch all term, which I know, like, uh, a lot of people have um, challenges with, I, I don't, it's not my favorite thing either. But just to clarify the language a little bit. So bottom line, and I think we all know this, who are here today, nurses shape data content and quality in healthcare systems. So when we think about, you know, from the time we're taught how to document in a clinical, um, or to complete our clinical doc documentation, how we complete that in practice, um, and then how we use those data to guide on um, the care provision, our care planning, et cetera. Um, we know that how we document, what we document, what we omit, um, shape, kind of how the trajectory of that care and potentially that patient's outcome is going to look like. So starting from that as kind of the base point in looking at data foundations. So thinking about data really as the raw material and in particular nursing documentation as the raw material. So a main driver of the a lot of the research that I'm doing these days is addressing fairness um, and moving towards equitable AI and a lot of that has to do with looking at data, starting with data as a raw material that's going to shape, you know, how or if if it isn't is if it is even possible to consider equity as we're building these technologies. Um, and so, in particular, you know, in, in this line of work, the questions that I always consider when starting with any project is, you know, thinking about who do we have the most information on, and who do we know the most about in the context of health data. So we know that there are um, inequities or disproportionate ways that we document things for particular kinds of people. So think about, you know, if you're in a, uh, somebody's electronic health record, how many tick boxes are there for gender identity, for example? Um, how many tick boxes are there for, um, you, you know, or how do you document what somebody's family unit look like um, and things like that. So we know that there are limitations. And for some people, it means that their data are more representative in their electronic health records. Whereas for other people who maybe don't have the checkbox, op, uh, the tick box option in the EHR, they're going to have missing data in their records. So I think about uh, you know, the surveys that you complete, demographic surveys that you complete, and you're asked to check tick box your um, uh, ethnic identity. Um, a lot of the time, I, I don't really know <laughs> what to take for myself. Am I, you know, one or the other? Um, as we are, you know, have more uh, children of mixed backgrounds, you know, that other field um, in the ethnic uh, tick box category, what does that actually mean in the future as we're moving towards, you know, um, more, uh, yeah, you know, families from more diverse backgrounds. Um, so thinking about that and then thinking about downstream, what does that then mean for how well um, their records reflect who these people, um, who everybody actually is? Um, so given who we know the most about, what does that then mean for the resulting technologies that we tend to create? So if we know the most about one type of people, um, does that mean we're designing only for that one type of need or for one, that one type of demographic? Um, and then what are the assumptions of, about the user upon which we build these technologies? So in terms of 
ability, capability, literacy, you know, things like that. We are making assumptions as we're designing these technologies about what people can and cannot do with them. And so how does that then play into how we build the technologies? Are we thinking broader than, you know, the typical well uh, able-bodied person, for example, as, um, as the end user of this technology? So questions for us, how and what do we document in terms of uh, clinical documentation? What do we omit and why? And we'll get into, you know, a lot of this has to do with conventions that we use and policies that we work with. Um, and what type of language do we use as we're completing the documentation? So thinking specifically about progress notes and any type of kind of written narrative note. So, um, now I'll talk a little bit about a study to help illustrate what some of this looks like. Um, Dawn, I think we can... So back to that question of who do we know the most about and documentation practices. So I go quickly through um, this idea of health data poverty. So there's this idea that um, there's an inab inability for individuals, groups, populations to benefit from a discovery or innovation due to insufficient data that are adequately representative. And I think this is the bit that I'm really trying to get at in a lot of this work is, you know, AI is supposed to change and make everything better. Um, but my question is for whom? Um, and the for whom question is always related to, you know, who do we have the most data about? Those are probably the people who can benefit the most because we can actually train our models um, on their data and, and use them. Um, and we know that their data are representative of them. But what about everybody else who do not fit into, you know, the typical patient who we know the most about? So just very briefly, these tend to be the people who we know the most about. Um, and this is, you know, from histories or conventions of how we collect data, who we value, whose data we value in the past. This is um, also reflected in publications, right? So you look at kind of uh, different trials that have been done, and these are mostly done on male, young, healthy, white, advantaged Western people. Um, and so underneath each of those categories that I've mentioned are the assumptions that we then make about one, sex and gender, age, ability, physiological norms, privileges, socioeconomic status, education. So thinking about, you know, if these are the training data, the bulk of the training data that we have to develop these tools, are these tools going to perform well for everybody else? Um, so contributing to data poverty and health systems are, you know, working in non-inclusive systems. So we know historically um, we have tended to value and collect data on dominant groups or concerns. So we see this, you know, in um, when we're needing to report um, for um, health health funding, right? There are certain kind of priority areas that you need to report on that's inadvertently uh, sending the message about what data are valued and what concerns are the most values valued. Um, it's difficult to change how we do things. So can you imagine having to rethink of clinical documentation, you know, not no longer documenting by exception? What does that look like? <laughs> um, what a mess will that look like? So it's difficult to kind of change a lot of the ways of doing things that have been so entrenched and established and so far ha have worked, you know, have met their purpose. Um, but in thinking about AI futures and what's possible or what we want to be possible, is that something we need to think on? Um, and then there's emergent understanding of what type of data are important to which group. So thinking about um, health goals, uh, you know, care goals of people, these aren't the same for everybody. Um, and so we are just starting to, I think, to appreciate that. The question then is, you know, is that, do, do we doc, do we capture that well in the records? Are those reflected? Um, as far as kind of building AI models, if it's not in the record, it doesn't exist basically. And so how do we reconcile that? And then there's also implicit bias that contributes to data poverty. So unfortunately, um, there's evidence that clinician bias makes their way into clinical documentation. Um, and there's evidence that there's um, 
that documentation can result in non-random missing data for some population groups. So there's been studies that have shown that for a particular ethnic group, they have more missing data that appears to be missing it non-randomly as compared to other groups. So further, um, you, you know, uh, thinking about AI benefiting everyone. Um, I, I like to put up this um, illustration, I think, because it nicely shows, you know, all the different social locations and, you know, identity positioning that we have. And so thinking again about, is this captured? Isn't it captured? When is it valuable to capture it? When is it harmful to capture it? And then what does that mean downstream for developing AI? Um, I think big, big questions are around kind of documentation practices and, and um, implications later on. So um, this is just an example of um, the, the point made earlier around implicit bias making their way into clinical documentation. So this is, you know, some of the recent papers that have come out um, talking about this. So there have been, you know, people that have looked into clinical notes and find found the use of stigmatizing language um, in, various types of written notes. Um, so then thinking about if we're building AI that's scraping from the clinical notes, what does that mean for predictions it's making? Are we building in the stigma um, into these models? How do we kind of get beyond that, knowing that historically this is the way we've done, but we want to move towards, you know, kind of more equitable futures and not using stigmatizing language? What's that middle ground of transition look like? So I keep talking about downstream implications, so we'll get to that now. So this is just kind of uh, some visual examples I thought might be really helpful. So we will probably already heard, um, for those of you who are kind of keeping an ear on um, AI things, that embedding and amplifying societal biases is a major, major issue in AI. And a lot of that has to do with what, um, you know, was talked about before around what the training data look like. It took looks like whoever we collect the most on, whoever the we kind of inadvertently um, show value for in society. And so that means then for making these models. So in this example, this algorithm is meant to try to predict the face of the person that is pixelated. Um, and so this is an early example. I know like Miles, things have changed kind of leaps ahead since I even created this like last November. Um, but you can see from the pixelated image here that that is obviously Barack Obama. Um, but whenever they tried to run through and predict the face, it would keep creating the face of a white man. Same with other examples here um, of people from different um, backgrounds. Um, it would keep turning them white. Why? The training data are trained on people um, who are largely of European white ancestry. And so it then makes sense that the model, the, these models are only as good as the data that go into them. So if they are not diverse, their outputs are not going to be diverse um, um, as well. Uh, another example here. So this is um, comparing two image generation models called uh, Stable Diffusion and DALI. And so this, you can see, sorry, it's going a bit fast. Um, you can select uh, an occupation and um, an adjective, and it will kind of generate, it will feed these as prompts into DALI and um, Stable Diffusion image generation. And you can see that depending on the occupation I'm selecting, it's, you know, creating mostly male or mostly female um, images. Um, once you start adding adjectives, these change a little bit sometimes. So here uh, with a nurse, I started adding ambitious um, and uh, for both models. And you can see that created a bit more diversity and a few more grumpy looking nurses because apparently that's what an ambitious nurse looks like. Um, to the point of, you know, the data, is as good, or the predictions are as good as what goes in it for the data. So these are some images that I created for this presentation. So the presentation software I'm using now has this image generator thing. Everything's got a plug in for Dolly pretty much these days or ChatGPT. Um, and so I think I was asking, the prompt was asking to create a Filipino nurse with an elderly um, Chinese man uh, showing them how to 
dress a wound or something like that. Um, it took a few tries, but you can see some of the, you know, things that kind of pop up in here from the training data. So it kept trying to give my nurse a cap um, and kept putting my nurse in a uh, skirt, even though I would say, you know, indicate scrub specifically, um, kept going white. I, I think I put in um, blue scrub specifically. Um, you can see too, you know, uh, image generation software has problems with hands. Um, for some reason, they can't create hands. Um, and I put as well that they're talking in front of an electronic health medical, electronic medical record. And it kept creating these kind of really futuristic images of what that would look like. Again, not reflective of, of reality, but reflective of what has been scraped to train these data that are available on the internet. Um, and again, reflecting biases. So this was my attempt at just creating a male nurse that was going into an apartment building. Um, I, I don't know, they all look like models. This first fella is, uh, when I specified he is average looking, apparently that's what an average looking uh, male nurse looks like. Um, but again, you can see how, you know, what is these reflect what we think about in society still currently because that's what the training data are so for the life of me i could not produce just a regular looking person who's not kind of uh ripped to shreds and looking like a model entering a home right so those are kind of illustrative fun dilafad examples um but in Apply, apply to health, then we get a bit more serious. Um, so this is a, kind of a landmark study per, uh, conducted by Overmeyer et al. Um, that came out um, a couple of years ago where they looked at a famous, uh, this is a famous case, they looked at an algorithm that was used to assign uh, risk scores and therefore care uh, for populations that used insurance spending data. And what they found was that the algorithm would assign um, black people as less sick as compared to white people, um, which you can imagine has implications for how care is then, um, you know, attributed. And the reason for that is because they used, um, uh, I think, medical costs or cost of care, I forget the term in the US, but that's what they used, or the amount of spending was what they used as a proxy for um, illness severity. The problem with that was that a lot of um, black patients were on Medicare. And so they um, less was spent on their care as compared to the people who would have private insurance, for example. And but that came out then as this kind of um, as this racial racially biased um, prediction. Um, and so, you know, this is one of a few examples where, you know, down the line, the completeness, the representativeness of the data that are used in developing these algorithms really matter. Um, and so this is just, my point here is just, there's different layers of biases that we need to deal with when we're talking about AI, um, where there's a lot of attention are statistical and computational biases. So you can develop um, techniques to address these kind of uh, computationally or statistically. There's the human biases that we've talked a little bit about, you know, how our own lens, ways of thinking, biases make our way into the work that we do and the things that we documented. And then the systemic biases. So this is when we're talking about the design of electronic health records, the policies around what is captured and isn't captured in clinical documentation. So these are all kind of shaping um, how, uh, how algorithms kind of, how biases make their way into these AI algorithms. Um, and so, we looked at also gaps in whose data and what data counts. So this, um, these couple of studies, the main points here is that, you know, there's evidence that EHRs generally don't function well for the purpose of nursing. So it's insufficient for capturing holistic care. Um, there's poor usability. It's not really meeting the needs of clinical nursing care. Um, and then um, this other study on the left is where we did a rapid review, just looking at the extent to which um, data other than medical data are used or talked about in AI. And we found basically that, um, you know, there's inadequacy of uh, re care relevant data capture. So that rapid review, we found that um, nursing and allied health 
uh, papers rarely would mention, uh, were mentioned or published as compared to uh, medical data collection. Um, and so generally there's poor collection and underuse of nursing and allied data. There's missing expertise, uh, right? So we think about the things that nurses are good at, um, that excel at, things like relational care, patient advocacy, assessment of social determinants of health. Those are largely not reflected um, in data that are collected, again, because of the, how we've structured things, um, the tools that we use and the policies that we enact. Um, there's a challenge then in being able to link care interventions to outcomes. So as I mentioned, you know, if it's not in the data, um, how are we possibly gonna track what are the outcomes of nursing interventions or types of care and things like that? And li this severely limits the possibilities for AI. Um, kind of just other illustrations of you know, where there are gaps in the data and why the data can be so biased. So this study recently looked at um, what US cohorts were used, which training data were used to train deep learning algorithms. And you can see a lot of them were using data from, you know, uh, California, Massachusetts, and New York. So what does that mean for what these data look like when they're mostly using kind of benchmark data sets from these places. Does that really reflect the populations that we are working with and that we're creating these tools for? Um, so examples of impacts of these data gaps, we saw this very clearly with um, COVID-19, right? So we saw that the, the communities getting hit the most were those who we had the least data on and we couldn't really, you know, it was a, it was a big problem uh, at one point in time trying to understand why these communities were getting hit so much. Um, I, Canada's had longstanding, um, I think, uh, approach of not collecting race data, unlike in other countries. Um, but there have been, you know, since COVID, uh, the recognition that, you know, while race is a social construct, that's important, it shouldn't affect care. Experiences of racism still do affect people's health outcomes. And so for that reason, um, collecting race data can, can be seen as important. So I point to in British Columbia, an Anti-Racism Data Act um, uh, has been uh, introduced um, and became law in, in trying to kind of address and catch up with some of these uh, structural things. So uh, from equality to equity, um, a lot of the models now um, that are using or trying to use social determinants of health to predict things, I, I feel personally, um, I, I still have limited views and don't really leverage the clinical expertise of nursing to think about equity in a broader sense. And so what that means is that algorithms are being built with sociodemographics still generally as what counts as social determinants. But thinking about future, we're, if we're talking really about, you know, complex care concepts, uh, patient-centeredness, equitable care, trauma-informed care, intersectional care, is that really going to be possible for us to have built AI tools when we don't have the data to support how what those look like? Um, how is that captured? Um, so I think there's a lot of progress that nursing can lead the way on if we are involved in the conversation um, at the start. So in terms of the kind of implications for nurses, it's the data work, it's making the data sets better, which is the hardest part, which is the least sexy part about a lot of AI work. But I think this is where we really have the power to kind of shape um, what happens. Uh, jump that a bit early. Um, you know, thinking about the, the conversations I'm having with people now is thinking about, yeah, like our, our, our documentation policies, is that still serving us? Will that serve us in the future? And I really want to encourage people to be forward looking. If we want AI systems that can really help us say, you know, wouldn't be wonderful to have an EHR system that says, hey, if you really want to provide person-centered care, these are the things about this person, um, maybe that you should talk with them about or look at. Um, but that has to start somewhere. And, and for now, I think given the volume, the power, like the volume of the nursing profession gives it a lot of power in terms of how to shape these data. And I think there's a real opportunity here um, to, to move towards that. 
So um, I'll stop there and hopefully have some time for a bit of conversation. So acknowledging uh, funders for um, the studies, um, I pulled from a lot of bits and pieces of other studies here. Um, so thanking funders, references here, and I will, um, maybe it'll be easier, um, uh, no, I'll, I'll pop in the um, the DOI in, in the chat box as well. So I'll hand it back over to you, Don. Thank you, Charlene. Uh, we do have time for a Q&A session. Um, you can either put the yep. question in the chat or uh, I think raise your, if you wanna, when you wanna, if you wanna stop sharing at some point, yeah, we can see hands being raised then. So however, however you wanna do that. So um, yes, please open, open the floor as it were uh, to any questions or comments. Don, may I say something? Um, okay, Sally. I see David's hand and then Sally. How's that? Dave, I see David's hand first, then Sally. Go ahead, David. Okay. Thank you very much. Dr. Ronquillo, that was a really provocative and interesting um, um, presentation. And uh, I'm really starting to appreciate the uh, importance of your research and those of your colleagues in this area. So, um, you know, as an educator, we're dealing with artificial intelligence in a different way in terms of uh, using that product in terms of uh, uh, the construction of knowledge and 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 research and so on. I, I found it really interesting the um, the uh, you're mining existing data uh, and you're looking at the language across uh, in your study across different uh, kinds of uh, nurses. At what point and how perhaps do you? do you recreate the universe of electronic health records to be much more representative or to be uh, much more um, in alignment with the uh, values held by uh, nurses in the clinical setting, such as, uh, as you mentioned, patient-centered care, holistic care, and so on. So I know it's a big question, but I would really appreciate your thoughts on that. And thank you again for a really great presentation. Thank you. Your uh, words are very, very kind and generous. Um, yes, yeah, so that's the big question. If I had the answer to that, I would be very, 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 very well off. Um, but I can speak to kind of what I'm hoping our study can contribute towards that. Um, so, I mean, that's like a politically fraught question in terms of procurement and who's in the room having the conversations and how much knowledge they have about how effective the EHR records are for the various different health authorities. So it has to do with kind of lobbying who's at the table and that kind of thing. What I'm hoping we can contribute in a small way through this study is is being able to tangibly point to, um, you know, uh, in insufficiencies in these particular electronic health records, because we're having conversations saying, you know, nurses want to contribute um, and they want to document holistically. So what they're doing is kind of squirreling things away in the progress notes, because that's the only place that'll allow them to put that right. in. But I think if we can say, we look through whatever many thousand notes, um, and it 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 is all in there um, and it's not being used for anything else. And so do we then need to rethink, is there a better way that we can capture that? So I think practically that's what I'm hoping for um, in terms of contributing to that. But um, yeah, I think it, like it's a political thing largely. And Dawn, just real quick, a postscript uh, question uh, for Charlene. And that is, um, where where does the experience and the voice of patients fit into the construction of these uh, documents and records? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and this is a conversation that needs to be had largely how uh, patient voices are not represented in AI research. Um, you know, thinking about, I was just speaking with um, someone yesterday about, you know, I don't think I've seen really any studies that have had patient goals as the target prediction, for example, of mm -hmm. any of these models. Um, so they're not well represented. So I, I don't know, actually, quite honestly, how that would look like, because there's also this push towards kind of patient health records. Um, there are people that are experimenting with collaborative health records where, you know, patients can go in to either verify or contribute and things like that. But I, I think that is part of the rethink. Um, you know, do we want to have spaces in electronic health records that are more reflective of 
the patient voice like directly from them. Um, you would hope that in the care that we provide as nurses that that is kind of passed on through, but we know it's like telephone game, right? Like things are lost along the line. I don't know if everybody will know telephone game. <laughs> um, things can be lost along the pathway. Thanks, Sally and then Catherine. Um, Charlene, uh, great to uh, see you again and fabulous presentation and the work you and your colleagues are doing, you know, some from the States and Canada, I think is clearly important. And I struggle right now. I'm at the end of my research, if you can believe it or not. But the, the biggest challenge has been is some of the clinical documentation assessments that nurses are asked, well, told to use, uh, do not reflect their practice and how their cognitive workflows. And um, particularly in my research, I'm, I'm right with you on the social determinants of health because in home care, which is my data set, they've, the home care, the RAI MDS assessments were developed for a different purpose. And they've been kind of, they keep calling them clinical assessments. What, but when you look at how the nurses are capturing or how they're asked to capture the information, it there it's just not aligned. And uh, so with my data set, you can imagine the missing data um, that I had to struggle with getting it ready to do the predictive analysis. But anyways, despite that, I'm thrilled about the notion of your work with the uh, scraping, looking at through natural language processing to try to see some common themes and hopefully then that can go full circle back to help those who are developing clinical assessments or revising. Um, I think our new world, it's gonna look, I'm with you, totally different. It's not gonna be what people think. Uh, so thank you. And uh, if you have any suggestions on uh, uh, social determinants of health from a community health perspective, I'm just writing out my recommendations now. Thank you so much, Sally, and thanks for sharing um, your experiences. We're both working with, yeah, very messy kind of <laughs> home care home care data. And that's, uh, I think one of the things that I often think, think about is in this work is even showing that things aren't there is important information, right? Because then it leads us to question is the issue because, I mean, I think we know <laughs> documentation is cumbersome and it's become this huge bloated thing now um, that's not really serving clinical needs, but just serving kind of administrative reporting purposes. Uh, but I think even illustrating in these, like, you know, we have so much missing data. And so is this is there a better way of doing this, for example, is, is an important question to, to ask. Thanks. Thanks, Sally. Catherine. Well, thank you. Uh, Charlie, it was really interesting. Uh, here in Quebec, we're trying to build up some work for uh, the coming of EPICS. <laughs> and uh, we have, um, we're trying to go uh, and use uh, the natural language and bring him into uh, ICNP or SNOMED. Um, and I'm like, if AI is getting ready to be able to work with natural language and process it, are we doing it wrong? <laughs> because right now it's just like, um, on, it's all natural language everywhere. It's not really, and it, it's really difficult to do that as said with the way we are working actually right now. So for us, it's it's already better if we follow a rule, but it's true that it's difficult to fit in it and to get the mindset to use those words. And it's giving you a lot of uh, pressure as a nurse to, to learn how to navigate to these uh, more formal ways of talking and uh, selecting things and everything that is... Uh, being prepped for you to just select stuff. <laughs> um, so I'm, I was just wondering, like, should we reconsider this way of going and just be a little bit more patient and wait for intelligent AI yeah. to wait for your, plug uh, in natural GPT language and the right <laughs> snowman that I said? So that's my API. first question. And the other thing was uh, also we were talking about racial um, uh, BS and everything, but there's also the opposite, like not talking about it. Like it's it's not 
taking in measure that some um, health issues are more common in certain uh, um, race and even for women like there's more risk yeah. for certain things and like I, I find that sometimes trying to take away all these information and trying to be just blank and and it's also not good for the health and it's it's uh, not pushing for better representation um from an interest of being able to uh, trigger recommendation according to your status or or your history or your family history or uh, anyway and with the genes coming <laughs> it there's a lot of things uh, that are changing anyway so these are my kind of <laughs> questions <laughs> thank you Okay, big question. So the first one, uh, it's it's interesting. Yeah. So a friend of mine who is um and colleague who's doing a lot of work on terminologies. I've been having a lot of conversation about this actually. I like to call it the um, standardized terminology exist existential crisis question at the moment. Although I think it's not as uh, bad as we thought. Um, but um, so I I guess coming back to the purpose of standardized terminologies and the benefits of them. I think this is where we, we are these days, but maybe Catherine, we need to invite you in this conversation and, and write this paper. Um, the, the, the great thing that terminologies provide is a rigorous way of coming, um, coming to those concepts, right? So the way that they're defined, their hierarchical structure um, are all, you know, there's an established way of doing it that is rigorous and that we know we can trust. So we say a concept is this, it maps onto this terminology. We know what that means. That's going to be really well defined. So while chat GPT, whatever you want to use, um, can pull out those words, they're kind of just a word hanging in the air and not connected to anything. And so I question, yeah, like how, is that really useful? Maybe at the instance, um, it could help. But in terms of, you know, thinking, trying to think about things kind of long term and big picture as well, um, is that going to be then an instance that you can never use again? Or is it going to be, you know, if it is connected to a terminology, then there's kind of some way of tracking what else it relates to and things like that. But this is a bigger conversation, I think. And maybe, yeah, we should um, connect after this because it's, yeah, <laughs> it's a big question. Um, and sorry, I uh, could you remind me quickly again your second question? It was about the the racial and sex and uh, all these questions that are having some impact on your health and yeah, to yeah. to be able to trigger right um, uh, to be able to push out notification or reminders according right, right. to this specific person. It's it, sometimes it's good to take these things in account too. Yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, so I think, I mean, people want to move in that direction of like super personalized to your profile and in your categories and what's important to you and things like that. Um, I, I think, you know, still the big thing is representativeness of data. So to be able to make a prediction of, about a particular population, we need enough representation of that population to be able to kind of trust that the, the thing is predicting based on data that are representative. Um, this part I didn't talk about in this talk, but in, in that... Um, that nail paper, we also talk about kind of this uh, interaction between the nurse as a human and, and the tools that we use. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about is kind of nursing being kind of a last point of check um, of any kind of tool that we use. So we do this for medications, we do this for any other intervention, we do this for any tool that we use. It's kind of that sanity check about you know, is this tool, is it, does this prediction, so in terms of AI, does this prediction make sense for the person that I'm working with? What do I know about the training data that were used to make this prediction? Do I know that it is limited and therefore maybe not the best choice for my client? Um, but you kind of the last line of, I don't want to say defense because AI doesn't necessarily need to be this kind of negative thing, but kind of the last point of, the last checkpoint to say, to, to kind of determine to what extent you're going to let that decision, that recommendation influence the work that you do. Because at the end of the day, it is still us, right? It is still nurses that are going to be making the decision. Something might, you know, give you more information, but at the end of the day, it's us. And so, yeah, I, I think that conversation is another one that needs to happen. I didn't talk about it here because it's already too much, but um, yeah, like how do we want to engage with these tools? What role do we want them to play and that kind of thing? Thank you.
we have just a couple of minutes left, so maybe I will stop and I'll just, I, I'd like to just honor everybody's time, uh, and, and including your Charlene. So um, I think we'll stop for now. So uh, thank you again very much, Charlene, for your presentation. And for all of you who registered for the webinar, please note that you'll be automatic, anybody who registered will um, be automatically sent a link uh, to, to, to the, in, in a few days. So, you, and you can feel free to share that with others in your network. And so again, just thank you uh, for joining us today and hope you'll consider joining us for our next Lunch and Learn series uh, in, in the new year. And please uh, you know, keep looking at our website for, for updates on those presentations. With that, have a good uh, rest of the day. Thank you. And I have just very last, oh. uh, the InfoWay survey. Um, I just wanna let people know um, about nurses' use of digital health. Really important to get our voices um, in there about how we're using stuff in nursing practice. So if you could, please, um, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you again, Don, for inviting me. Thanks. Take care.